Good morning. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, warm welcome. Sorry I couldn't be here yesterday. I had a meeting at the university, uh, my university on, on Thursday, so I could only leave yesterday. Ladies and gentlemen, it is always right and just to praise the achievements of Ludwig von Mises, and in particular the publication of uh, Human Action 75 years ago. It is a pleasure to do this among people who share my appreciation, thankfulness, and love uh, of the, to this great man and his ideas. It uh, very seldom occurs that I'm asked to recount the ongoing impact of Ludwig von Mises' magnum opus on my intellectual development. Now, that is exactly what Professor Salerno asked me to do. So, thank you very much, dear Joe. Whatever stupid things I will say now are therefore also your fault. <laughs> Like most of us in this room, I've never met uh, Ludwig von Mises in person. I first encountered his ideas some 20 years after his passing. In what follows, I will first describe this encounter, and then I will zoom in uh, on his book, Human Action, and explain why it embodies the research paradigm of praxeological realism, and also what the challenges related to it are. The first time I had read about Ludwig von Mises must have been in the summer of 1991. I was studying mechanical engineering, management, and economics at the Technical University of Berlin, as well as philosophy at the Free University of Berlin. My main field in economics was international and monetary economics. The classes were taught by Professor Hans Hermann Lechner at the Technical University. In one of the numerous endnotes, to his uh, treatise on monetary policy, he praised Mises and Hayek for their critique of socialism. Now, I should emphasize in passing that at the time, in the good old days, so to say, students were still reading books. <laughs> <laughs> and some books had to be studied cover to cover to prepare for the exams. Um, so I, uh, I mean, this was one of the books I just studied cover to cover, and you also read the end notes, make sure that you see, see all this, because he might, might ask a nasty question about this, so you better prepare. Yeah. In his, and, and unfortunately for my students in Angers, I tend to do the same thing. Right? <laughs> yeah. In his classes, uh, Professor Lechner often stated that the history of economic thought was not a one-way street, and that big nuggets could be found in the older writings. I heeded the lesson. When a few years later, I heard Mary Rothbard oppose what he called the Wick theory of history, I remembered that I had first heard this criticism in the lecture hall in Berlin. The first time I opened a copy of Human Action was in the late summer of 1992. By then, I had come across the name of Mises a second time. I had spent the academic year 91-92 in France at the Toulouse Business School. In those days, the school had only one full-time economics professor. His name was Claude Courtois. The good professor could not care less about management, but he was very eager to coach the students who showed any interest in intellectual matters. And there were always some students of this sort. Their parents had sent them to the business school. Um, but, um, uh, they did not cherish marketing, finance, and human resources. They appreciated philosophy, economics, sociology, anthropology, history, and political science, and what have you. Dr. Courtois was there to help them out. He had created a teaching program designed to prepare these students for a career in research and teaching. And I must say, quite a few professors came out of this program. It was certainly made for me. Uh, this reminded me of a funny story when uh, I, I lived for a couple of years in the U.S. The first year I spent in Buffalo, uh, New York, so my wife made the acquaintance uh, of, of, of another lady who was pregnant as she was, and then they were exchanging. So she said, oh, that's so terrible. I married a lawyer, and now he's turned into a Ph.D. student in philosophy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was the same thing, right? So the poor parents said their kids say, yeah, one day you'll be, we'll be rich and we earn a lot of money, ton of money, and uh, take care of your old parents, and then they study anthropology. <laughs> in the second semester, we had to write a substantial research paper. Since I was interested in economic policy and had much more libertarian uh, uh, bend of mind than my French classmates, even though at the time I was no more than an open-minded social democrat, uh, Dr. Courtois had me read Hayek's Counter-Revolution of Science, 
uh, as well as a collection of articles by Murray Rothbard, which had just appeared in, in a French translation under the title Economists and Charlatans. <laughs> this was my initiation to Austrian economics, but it did not turn me into an Austrian. I was much more eager to learn more about the German auto liberals, who is a very interventionist uh, school of thought, uh, sometimes also called the Freiburg uh, School of Economics. Then something unexpected happened. When I presented my project to the class, Dr. Courtois felt uh, it was not clear at all what kind of writing I was up to. So he challenged me, as a good professor should, what kind of research do you want to do? Is it like Mises or like Sombart? Here was his name again, Mises. And I still had not read a single line from his pen, uh, nor from Zombard, by the way. I had a hunch, since I had, I had seen Mises in the footnote of, uh, end of my professor, that I would turn out to be closer to Mises than to Zombard. Uh, and I said so. My intuition in late 1991 was, in hindsight, a premonition of things to come. Having studied all books from Mises and quite a few books from Zombard, I can vouch that in economics, my hometown is Vienna, not Berlin. <laughs> Upon my return to Germany in the summer of 1992, I had to write a master thesis. Uh, it was a hot summer, but I spent it mostly in the library and in front of my laptop. My work dealt with uh, economic conceptions of power. That's when I came across Mises the third time. Uh, and this time, I would actually read a few pages in Human Action in which Mises dealt uh, with the difference between contractual bonds and hegemonic bonds. It was obvious to me then that he was an eminently clear writer and a deep thinker, but I did not have, have time uh, to uh, study his treatise in any detail. At the end of the, that year then, I enrolled in doctoral studies in money and banking under uh, Professor Lechner again, and now there was time for in-depth uh, reading, especially in the field of monetary economics. The first book on my shelf was Mises' Theory of Money and Credit, the German, German version. I thought that be, uh, before turning to the present day literature, it would be helpful to take a book, uh, uh, take a look at the state of the monetary thought at the onset of World War I in order to appreciate the progress that had been achieved ever since. <laughs> I opened the book at uh, Christmas of 1992 and was in for a great surprise. This old master excelled in clarity of expression and he had dealt with a subject of immense importance, namely the nature, the causes and the consequences of the subjective value of money. From my previous studies, I knew that this topic had been completely neglected and wrongly so by the subsequent literature. Even more intriguing was the way Mises approached this topic. He did not posit some more or less plausible hypotheses about possible causal connections between money prices, the money stock, interest rates, exchange rates, and so on, and then present various statistics and whatever other evidence was available to support his contentions. Rather, he proceeded in a purely logical step-by-step -step deduction. He started from first principles relating to the nature of money and the nature of human action, and eventually worked his way to monetary policy and banking policy. <coughs> Even though I understood immediately how very different this book was from the standard text on money and banking, at the time, uh, I was too ignorant to appreciate its achievements more fully. Therefore, allow me to, to quote what I wrote 20 years later on the importance of the book. Mises succeeded in creating a new way of looking at monetary and banking theory by fitting it into the subjectivist theory, value theory developed by Karl Menger. Not only did Mises develop an entirely new fundamental concept, but he also provided numerous suggestions and clarifications to specific theoretical questions. The most important of these contributions was placing the general theory of subjective value on the foundation of the logic of choice, something that Menger had not done. He developed a subjectivist classification system of money as well as a systematic theory of the causes and effects of money prices, tracing everything back to demand and supply and demand and supply to subjective value. He researched the international impact of the changing supply of and demand for money and became a pioneer in international monetary re uh, economics. So Professor Salerno, I remember, had an article on this topic. He studied the principles of price formation in unorganized markets. 
He criticized mechanistic approaches to the quantity theory of money and to value theory, index number theory, as well as the theories of the currency school and the banking school. Last but not least, he developed a famous crisis theory, which argued that the artificial expansion of the money supply tended to entail intertemporal imbalances within the production structure. That's the end of quote. I did not close the book before I had studied it from cover to cover and taking numerous notes. At the end, I had become a great admirer of this old economist from Vienna. I had started to become a Misesian. The next thing was to read as many books from Mises as I could get a hand on. One of these books was National Economie, the German language predecessor of human action. At the time, there was not much secondary literature on the differences between the two books. I therefore focused my attention on what I believed to be the German original text in order to sidestep any imprecisions that might have resulted from the translation. Uh, a few years later, I understood my error. But uh, uh, the, the, the hypothesis was not absurd, uh, uh, absurd, and it served me well in the case of another example, namely the theory of money and credit. In the theory of money and credit, as I've pointed out in two uh, papers, uh, there are major translation problems which uh, vitiate uh, the, the understanding of, of the overall message of, of the text. And one consequence of this was the emergence of fractional reserve uh, banking advocates within the, the Austrian group uh, in the US. It's, it's a consequence of this wrong uh, uh, translation. So it served me well in that case that I studied uh, the original text, not the, the other one. But in the case of human action, it's an error. But one of the reasons for the perennial value of human action is that a lot of time went into the elaboration and presentation of its content. Mises worked on writing National Economie from 1934 to almost 1940, which is the normal time for writing a treatise. I mean, normal time, not for a complete beginner, but for somebody who has a few years of experience. Of course, the preparation time was much longer since large parts of the book relied on his previous research. But then he had the opportunity, or I might say also he was forced by the circumstances, uh, to do the same work again. And moreover, he was forced to do it in a foreign language. The great disadvantage of writing in a foreign idiom is that you lose nuance and context. Okay, that's a big problem, of course, for everything related to poetry and novels and so on. It makes it very difficult sometimes to translate it. But it's also a problem in science, for, uh, most notably for the work of historians, who deal precisely with nuances, deal with the special and often unique circumstances of human action that prevail here and there, but uh, not elsewhere and at other times. But that is not a big problem for praxeology, which, after all, deals with universals that is, with what holds true at all times and in all places. The great advantage of writing in a foreign idiom is that it becomes impossible to brush over any imprecision in thought. I cannot cheat, so to say, right, by using vague, uh, ambiguous expressions and, and so on. Right? Sometimes it's a little difficult. Ah, you don't really want to spend another two minutes to think this through. I mean, what's the exact way of putting it? So you have something, a formula that makes it right, maybe not quite, uh, quite, uh, quite right, but approximately right, right? So that's easy for somebody who is at ease in his own language. It's virtually impossible if you have to do it in a foreign language. It just, just doesn't work. So as a consequence, human action is very, very precise. And you see it when you have to translate uh, any of this into another language, you never have any problems, translation problems. For example, you do have translation problems sometimes with Rothbard. And I have experience in both this because I translated Mises and Rothbard. Rothbard, precisely, was so at ease. Sometimes there's a little formula. You, and say something that goes down like oil and, or, or milk <laughs> or whatever nice drink you can imagine. <laughs> and, and it really brushes over a little imprecision because, I mean, it's, it's, it's nothing dramatic in the case of the Austrians. They're just very, very sturdy thinkers. But, right, so Mises, in, in the case of human action, uh, well, we have such a fine book, not least of all, because it is crystal clear. Studying national economy allowed me to relearn economics bottom up. I think uh, that I mentioned that my preferred method of study is to read comprehensive books from cover to cover, uh, taking copious notes, and I recommend this, by the way, to all my students. Uh, in national economy, I was confronted with a deductive approach that I had already appreciated in the theory of money and credit, but now there was so much more. 
here appeared an entire system uh, of thought dealing with uh, two intricately related subjects, namely human action on the one hand and the signs of human action on the other hand. Now, the signs of human action, the, uh, scientific ex uh, activity, and this is what Professor Hopper had pointed out in a, in, in a paper that appeared in the recent uh, past uh, five years or so, is uh, the, the science of human action is itself, right? Scientific ex activity is itself uh, human activity, right? So therefore, it falls under the general categories of the science of human action. So when you talk about human action in general, well, it also covers scientific uh, activity. So the two are not only related, they're intricately uh, related. Mises is often portrayed as a fountainhead of modern libertarianism, and rightly so. But the emphasis of the book is elsewhere. He discussed economic policy only in the last parts of national economy. The main body dealt with the foundations of the theory of human action, starting with epistemological questions, and then continuing with an exposition of the universal features of human action, such as the laws of subjective value, the laws of return and the principles of the division of labor. Before he even say, says the first word about the market economy, Mises stresses the fundamental importance of economic calculation. And so only where you have the possibility of economic calculation, only there can you compare physically heterogeneous um, uh, production processes, only there can you develop uh, in a meaningful whole, right, uh, uh, roundabout production processes, right, because you always need to make the, the, the decision, well, do I invest more money, do I invest more uh, physical resources, more labor, uh, and so on, in the production of uh, the, the plastic that goes into the uh, final production of uh, uh, these, these glasses, or into the final composition of the glasses themselves, or do I use the same raw materials elsewhere? How do you make the comparison without some numerical a comparison as we have it in economic calculation is just not possible. Right. So he stresses that this is fundamental, and then he also goes on with the economic system in which, or the economic order in which uh, calculation is possible, and that's the market order, because in the market order there is the tendency for the emergence of a medium of exchange, namely money. I have no doubt uh, that uh, the main factor that drove Mises' passion for economics and praxeology was the possibility to apply these conceptions in practice. They laid the foundation for rational economic policies. And so that's, after all, so it's, it's not science for the sake of science. It's, it's not just an ivory tower activity. It's something that is linked to the real world. But the novelty and force of the book was that he argued that there were praxeological laws which could be identified and defined with the help of a priori reasoning. In other words, Mises made the case for praxeological realism. For me, coming with a background in uh, mechanical engineering, philosophy, and neoclassical economics, this is what made the book so intriguing. It was at odds with all the standard ways of thinking, but praxeological realism was not obviously absurd. Right? You just read a few pages from Mises, and you see what, what, how does he argue, and you say, well, okay, that's, that's not obviously wrong. Right? So uh, what's, what's the issue here? Right? It was clearly an intellectual challenge, and to be sure, it was also a political challenge, at any rate, in the eyes of those who are accustomed uh, to justify each and any policy with tits and bits of so-called research. And uh, therefore, I propose that we look at these challenges in a bit more detail. Right? So there's the intellectual challenge and the, the prax uh, practical challenge. Uh, following Karl Menger, uh, Mises argued that there are exact economic laws that is, there are relationships between causes and consequences that do not merely hold true here and there, but which are liable and which are liable to change in the future, but which hold true at all times and places. They are universal and immutable. Going beyond Banger, Mises argued, in particular, uh, added two points, namely that all economic laws are emanations of the nature of human action. Right? This is may be implicit if we give it a charitable reading uh, in Mises, in, in Menga, but it's not, certainly not explicit. Right? In Menga, everything starts with the theory of value, and the theory of value of is, is connected to, to human action, but uh, could also be some, some platonic idea that just uh, is there in, in cyberspace. And uh, uh, so all economic laws are emanations of the nature of human action, right? So they are praxeological laws, and he also argued, secondly, 
that the way we come to know, to demonstrate, and to refute these laws, in, in case they are wrong, the articulation is wrong, is uh, through pure uh, reasoning. He did not inherit these ideas at home or at the university. He came to hold them on his own and at great cost for himself. As a student at the University of Vienna, Mises was confronted with two opposing schools of economic thought, the German historical school and the Austrian school. He started off attending the seminars of the historicist professors. They thought that there were no universal laws of economics. All causal relationships in the sphere of human action were historically contingent. They are only true depending on the circumstances, and the circumstances are bound up in a constant flux of change. The causal sequences that determine economic life in Germany in the 1890s are therefore unlikely to be valid in France in the 1950s or in Iran in the 2020s, or maybe even in, in France and Iran in the 1890s. Mises eagerly absorbed the hypo historicist hypotheses and methods. In fact, he became himself a very promising disciple of the historicist approach. So this is something that I, I explain in, in the Mises uh, biography in, in much more detail. But then he encountered the writings of Karl Menger, the fountainhead of the Austrian school. Menger taught that there were not only contingent facts and causal relations, right? so everybody agrees that such contingent relations exist, but also exact and universal laws that determine the values and prices of all economic goods. In his eyes, economic science revolved around the study of such universals whereas the study of contingent facts and relations was the proper job of, his, of historians, uh, not of economists. And Mises came to conclude that Menger and his disciples, Bimbaerwerk and Wieser and, and the others, were right. He dedicated the rest of his life to developing the Austrian approach, and that's what we are still doing here today in and around the Mises Institute, right? where we, are, we hold on to this notion that there are universals, and universal causal relationships, and there are also contingent ones, right? and uh, in, in further promoting the study of these universals, uh, refining this, well, we follow in the footsteps of Menga and uh, Mises. Now, it was this decision that cost him his academic career, and that comes at cost for us still today. Right? So let's, let's be honest about this. Right? <laughs> the tenets of the Austrian school have almost always been unpopular with the powers that be. So when I discovered Mises' uh, theory of money and credit, and I was, my, my, the topic of my dissertation was uh, currency competition. This was in, in the footsteps of Hayek, so it was written about the denationalization of money, so I was interested in the praxeology of currency com competition. So I discovered Mises and said, wow, fantastic. The guy has been completely overlooked. Here we have a research gap. Right? Now oh, that's already the originality and, and, and merit of, our, uh, of my project is already short. We just have to slam it down. It's a slam dunk uh, home run <laughs> for which I'm in, right? <laughs> yeah, so this is what happens when you're na naive and uh, yeah. But of course, that's the attitude that you need to have as a good researcher. Right? You need to be a little bit like a child. You need to be naive because you need to have this openness. Uh, otherwise, uh, you will never be able to discover anything that you didn't know before, right? So you need this also. Well, so uh, I was very proudly presenting my stuff and so on. Complete disinterest on the side of my director. Right? <laughs> Eventually, the, the poor guy, he had to deal with it in one way, so then we had a defense, we had a shouting match, uh, uh, 90 minutes, that is shouting very one-sided. He was shouting, I was <laughs> <laughs> responding calmly, so that, that, that was very impressive, apparently, to, to the other. Uh, committee members. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, because I learned my economics at, at that point, right? So I had it from Mises, and I knew all the mechanics, which he, did, he hadn't. So and I, I had a response for everything. So uh, yeah, so it got me my PhD. But then, of course, what do you do with a PhD if nobody wants to hire you, right? <laughs> yeah, well, so there, there came a succession of accidents. Uh, I will spare you the details, maybe for another time. Um, if there are universal laws of cause and effect, then governments and political parties are not omnipotent. They must conform the decisions, their decisions, to an objective reality which they do not control. 
This can be a bitter pill to swallow for an ambitious ruler, it, uh, and it can be a veritable stumbling block in an election campaign in which one party tries to outbid the others with ludicrous promises. Mises has always upheld truth to power and thereby provided great services to humanity. However, he was not uh, uh, useful to the powerful, and therefore he had to spend his life on the margins of state-funded academia. And that's unfortunately how it stays in the present, although uh, I see that young Austrians are making progress in uh, getting into professorships and so on, simply because young Austrians typically are very well trained in economics, uh, whereas most others are completely ignorant. Uh, what, what I see in PhD training uh, these days is mainly uh, trained to, to, to mimic uh, guys from the physics department uh, who are just not interested in economics, so they're just number crunching, right? just applying methods. Uh, 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 computing uh, uh, numbers in, in, in the hope of finding any causal uh, quantitative relationship that might be interesting uh, or not. Now, I mean, that's not the way to learn something about economics and to explain economics to students. It's just not, it's not, it's not possible. And as a consequence, Austrians have an increasingly good standing on the job market, I think. Praxeological laws cannot be demonstrated or refuted by systematically observing economic data, such as the prices and quantities of market exchange, because data, uh, we would say today, are noisy, right? So they do combine, right? Data always result from a combination of universal causes, but also contingent ones. And, okay, much research now in, uh, in econometrics uh, tries to disentangle these two components, but well, this, is, this comes at a huge margin of error. And, we actually, uh, contrary to the physical sciences, we cannot determine the margin of error. So, I mean, scientifically speaking, this is quite a disaster and uh, not, not justifiable since we have a better alternative, which is Austrian economics. Now, praxeological realism, so it, uh, it includes several elements, of course, it's always grounded in human action, is rooted in human action, something that really exists, concrete human action, and then it involves a universal Right? Uh, and so it's, some, it's a universal relationship between any decision that we make and the consequences that follow from it, uh, uh, respectively, between the, the causes of, of human action, because human action does have causes right, in, uh, in subjective value. And so the laws of subjective value therefore determine partially um, uh, human action. Uh, the existence of universal is, is fundamental for human life. Right? Without uh, universal causal relationships, uh, we would not embark on an aeroplane, right? because all the laws that have been studied uh, relating to the construction and use of aeroplanes have been constructed in a laboratory setting, not elsewhere. Right? People first came to know these things, and then they built aeroplanes. And we, uh, hike, uh, we jump into an aeroplane and fly because we believe these uh, things that they found in the laboratory to be universal. Right? They do not only hold at MIT in August 1991, but they hold true at all places, in all, uh, all times in all places. Right? So it, as far as physics is concerned and mathematics and logic, this has always been uh, non-contentious. Right? 7 plus 5 volts is, is 12 right? uh, at all times in all places. It, it becomes contentious as soon as we move out of uh, physics and mathematics and move, touch on anything that concerns human action, in particular political decision making. Right? The great Leibniz had once said, well, if geometry had the slightest political implication, it would be contested. <laughs> and he's right. right? And so economics is such a hotly contested uh, topic, some people are incapable of discussing it calmly because the, the ramifications, the practical ramifications are more or less obvious. Right? So in Mises, we have this, uh, uh, this idea. So now the, the question is, of course, are universal laws praxeological laws? Well, this can uh, well only be uh, demonstrated by concrete examples. Right? You take one or two, right? it takes the law of, of subjective value, and it says, well, uh, a, a greater uh, um, one unit of a homogeneous good in a larger stock has a smaller value than one unit of uh, same econ economic good in a smaller stock, right? And uh, because uh, in, in the larger stock, with the larger stock, you can realize additional projects with, with, with this type of good, and these additional projects are necessarily less important than the ones that you would have executed with a smaller stock only, 
right? Now that's a praxeolog praxeological demonstration, right? It's, it's a necessary relationship that does not follow from any psychological predisposition of, of the agent. And it has nothing to do with how he values goods and what his ranking is, how he tends to use it, and, 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 and so on. So that's uh, praxeology. Mises following um, uh, Frank Fetter uh, also showed the same thing in, reg in regards to the laws uh, of uh, return and so on. So I'll skip this over. I want to conclude and leave you a few a minutes for questions. Okay, so th then let me just uh, say, well, how has Mises impacted my subsequent career? Well, in January 1997, Lou Rocco was kind enough to commission me with writing a Mises biography. So I had, thanks to this, the opportunity to study Mises in great detail, really covering all of his texts and so on, and meditating for many years on um, his work and the implications. And it was uh, it eventually led to the publication of uh, my, my uh, Mises biography in 2007. But I've also, uh, in my own research, my theoretical work, I've uh, tried to fill in the gaps that I felt Mises had, had left. Um, uh, in, in some elements of, of his thought, which are not very important, but I mean, they, they concern uh, topics that are sometimes interesting. For example, the distinction between profit, on the one, uh, profit and loss on the one hand, and interest payments on the other hand, relies on the concept of economic equilibrium. Right? Now, according to Mises, the concept of economic equilibrium is an imaginary construction, right? So there we are in Dodo land, right? So we, are in, we, we construe something, and it's not clear how this relates to, uh, this relates to human action. So I've tried to uh, come up with, with a different exp uh, explanation. Uh, and uh, same thing uh, in regards to the nature of economic laws. Right? I've, I've uh, argued that uh, uh, from a praxeological point of view, um, uh, economic laws are uh, very often counterfactual laws, right? They relate uh, something that we do and the consequences that follow from it to something else that would have happened if we had taken an alternative, different choice. Uh, I've studied the praxeological nature of financial markets and more recently I've, I've studied the praxeological nature of uh, gifts and uh, uh, other uh, gratuitous uh, goods, right? So, which means also had, had not been interested in, so it's, it's, I see all of my work as complementary to Mises, so I wouldn't say that uh, no human being is perfect, so Mises uh, too was not, was not perfect, but it's certainly been a most useful and appreciated starting point for all of my work, and I'm thankful to him and uh, thankful for, for your interest in this, in this topic. Thank you, Dr. Holzman. Yeah. Uh, so kind of just to continue on your comment about Austrian economics uh, not being so on the fringe anymore, what do you think uh, the future for young Austrian scholars is uh, with people like Javier Malay uh, taking over countries like Argentina, mm -hmm. and um, at least in the United States, I think Dave Smith, a uh, prominent libertarian uh, who follows Austrian economics, mm -hmm. who's just on Tucker Carlson. So what do, you, what do you see looking forward as the Austrian school advances? Well, the... the uh, Topic that, that you mentioned, so policy advice and so on, is certainly one avenue. But of course, it can be very discouraging if you're in the country as in the US, nobody's interested in Austrian economics because you have a two party system and they just hang out amongst themselves. They're not really interested in ideas at all. Right? So, therefore, somebody like uh, uh, Stockman, he's so outlandish, right, because he brings in ideas. Um, uh, but still, as, as the, the case of uh, Xavier Millet shows, is that you need to be prepared. One of the great weaknesses of his presidency right now, as I see it, is th that he does not have enough people. He cannot fill, I mean, that was also a weakness of the Trump presidency, right? He wanted to act against the swamp, but he had to fill his cabinet and all the second and third uh, tires with, with the swamp people. So that, that will not work. So it would be uh, certainly helpful to specialize in um, economic reform, right? Uh, how should we go about reforming the health system? How should we go about reforming the pension system? How about reforming the monetary system? What's, what's the best way to proceed? Have a, a blueprint in the drawer, so to say, right? and discuss the, 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 the problems that will result from it, uh, strategies that, that would be suitable to confront these issues and, and so on. So that's definitely an avenue, but that will not make you an economic, academic career. I need to be careful, right? If you have a, a PhD dissertation on this, <laughs> this will not uh, carry very... So you need to do this on the side, right? But it's definitely very important. How would you apply it uh, for an executive running a business? 
How would I apply it for an executive? No, 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 no. How would you apply the taxiology of, of Austrian economics in running a business knowing you have this overlord of mm -hmm. insane policy? Oh, yeah, so that, that's a big question. I mean, praxeology itself, uh, I think, is, of course, is marginally helpful in running a business in the sense that it allows you to avoid various mistakes, right? Uh, and uh, it, it gives you a clearer a conception of, of the nature uh, and, and scope of political power, right? Your ramification on your work. So that's certainly helpful. But then as an entrepreneur, uh, Mises once called the entrepreneur uh, the historian of the future, Okay. The historian deals with unique circumstances. He's not into universals. Right? He, he has to deal with real life in the concrete situation which he, that he analyzes. And the entrepreneur has to deal with real life in the concrete situation which he is. And most notably, he has to anticipate future conditions. Right? So here, praxeology is only indirectly helpful. Right? Of course, if you think that, well, the, the, the Fed is increasing the money stock and you think that prices will uh, uh, fall, right? so that you might have a little problem in your uh, anticipations. But uh, other than that, right? so uh, you have to do your, your extra job. Yes? Oh, wait a minute. There's a question over there. Uh. Okay. In terms of uh, economic calculation, how do you deal with the issue of the natural rate of interest and how to establish that in going you know, forward through your economic calculations? Well, I, I think for uh, entrepreneurial cal calculation, the issue is not important, right? Because what you are interested in is uh, the, the relationship between your expected selling proceeds right, on an investment horizon that is for you relevant, might be six months, might be three years, might be 30 years, right? relative to the cost expenditure. What the natural rate of interest in does not f enter the picture at all. You're dealing with concrete prices. Right? The natural rate of interest is important from an economic point of view if you want to distinguish the different causes that come into play in your revenue. Because at, at the end of the day, you will earn profit or not. If you earn profit, uh, it will result from different causes. Right? One cause is uh, the original interest rate. Another cause is the errors of your competitors and your own errors. Right? Uh, and one other cause uh, is uh, risk that, that is prevalent and, and, and so on. Right? So different elements that come into play. But you are, as an entrepreneur, you are only concerned with totals. Right? It's the total revenue that counts for me. It's, it's the total cost. It's not really the different causes. You, you don't care. Um, my question is about the structure of praxeology. Praxeology starts with universal general laws. And then you deduce from those laws more uh, laws or minor laws, one might say. Does this uh, logical deduction end at some point when the deductions become m very fine-grained? Or there's, is there always some phenomena, economic phenomena that economists study and new phenomena appear, so there will always be new deductions? Yeah, I think that there's, there's always something. Uh, I mean, uh, there's marginally, there's always something new that you can uh, discover. It's, it doesn't come very often, but it, it's possible. <laughs> But mainly, uh, I mean, you, you should not imagine that in praxeology, you, you start from these very uh, general things, and then you boil it down until you end up in country, country uh, reality, and you explain reality only with praxeological laws. That's, that's not possible, right? Uh, because you always uh, need to take uh, account of the contingent factors, right? For example, you need to, why uh, does the Fed board make the decision that it makes? The motivations today are not the same ten, uh, that they were 10 years ago, uh, 20 years ago, and so on, right? Or, uh, well, technological uh, uh, advancement is not the same today than it was 10 years ago, and so on. So there's always new stuff that comes into play that has nothing to do with praxeology, right? Uh, and there's an economy of thought also, right? Because it makes no sense to uh, spend huge uh, amount of time in praxeology, I mean, from a practical point of view, uh, entrepreneur, right? If the other factors are more important, become more important, right? So there are also, in analysis, there's a cost there, there that comes into play, right? So, um, yeah, uh, the, the, praxeology is a bit like uh, mathematics, right? You can uh, learn whatever, 95 or, or more per percent of what you need to know by just uh, spending a few months studying human action, uh, man, economy, and state, and this will prepare you for virtually uh, everything that you uh, encounter in praxis, right, from a, uh, from a praxeological point of view.